Canadian Studies Centre in the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. And I would like to welcome all of you to our 13th annual Fulbright Canada Lecture. And I want to say that in those 13 years, this is our first that is dedicated to education. So very excited about this because Canadian Studies is a US designated uh, National Resource Centre for the study of Canada. And so of course, education is our number one mandate, but also education is a number one mandate for the Inuit in Canada today. And just a little bit of background, in 2005, um, the last land claim was settled in Canada, the last Inuit land claim was settled, creating Nunatsiavut. And when that land claim was settled, and this is 30 plus years of efforts on land claim settlements, then um, the then uh, president of the Inuit, the National Inuit Organization, Mary Simon, stated that education would be the next goal for the Inuit and educational capacity. So I see today's, um, I see today's event being very much part of that vision. So very, uh, really excited to welcome our guests today, Kathy Snow, our Fulbright Chair, and our other guests, um, that this will be our discussion today. And I wanna begin by acknowledging that the University of Washington is on traditional Coast Salish lands and lands that have enabled us to study, research, work, and teach here for over 100 years. And I also want to recognize that we have, I know a number of you from across North America. So I want to recognize all of the traditional inhabitants of North America, um, because I think online today we have representatives from New York, Nova Scotia, Nunatsiavut, Ottawa, Prince Edward Island, of course, Seattle, and maybe more places. I'm not sure who everyone who is on here. Um, I also want to thank Marian Ferguson, our outreach coordinator, because today would not be possible without her. We're all um, on this fast learning curve of learning Zoom, and this is the Canadian Studies' first public lecture on Zoom, so our public presentation. So it's been quite a learning curve for us, and I just wanted to ask you to bear with us if we have any glitches as we move forward today. And Marian, did you want to say anything just in terms of housekeeping on um, today's event? Uh, yes, we ask mm -hmm. that you please keep yourselves muted during the actual presentation and talk. Mm -hmm. um, that'll just make it easier for our speakers to be heard. Um, I did ask in the email that I sent to all of you that if you are comfortable, you keep your video on. And I see most of you have done that. Um, it makes it a much more welcoming environment. So I, I appreciate that you're doing that. Um, when we get to the question and answer session at the end of the talk, uh, please either type your questions into the chat box, um, visibly get our attention by waving your hand, or use the raise hand feature, which you can find if you click on the participants um, button at the bottom of your screen, um, and it'll have an option for you to raise your hand down there. Uh, and that's all. If you have uh, issues during the talk, feel free to chat to me and I'll try to help you um, work through them. Good. Thank you, Marian. So our program, we're going to go until one o'clock with the official program. And then those of you that need to leave, we let you go. And then we're going to continue with question and answer until about 1.30. So I also want to thank our five sponsors. And that includes the Pacific Northwest Canadian Studies Consortium. Thank you, Gary Wilson. ArcticNet Canada, thank you, Christine Barnard, and I'm delighted to meet you today. Um, we wanna thank UW Center for Native American and Indigenous Studies, thank you, Jean Dennison, the Consulate General of Canada in Seattle, thank you, Jennifer Odette and Rob Kerr, and the Foundation for Educational Exchange between Canada and the United States, thank you, Alana DeMoss, and a special thanks to you, Michael, I wanna thank you personally, for we've been working together with the chair for 13 years, but prior to that, working toward initiating that chair. And just thank you for your close friendship and all you have done to help us energize our research on Canada here at the University of Washington. So thank you. And I'd like to introduce now Professor Richard Watts, our faculty director in the Canadian Studies Center.
Hello all, uh, I'm just so delighted that we can host this event, even though it's not in person, but as, uh, as we were saying before we officially got going, doing this remotely um, has allowed us to, to bring together a group of people that otherwise um, might've been very difficult to, to pull off. And, and I just want to add to uh, the acknowledgements that, that um, Nadine gave us, another acknowledgement so as somebody who is uh, faculty in a, in a language program, who's very interested in uh, questions of major and minor languages, dominant and, and so-called subordinate languages, um, I, I wanna point out that the Center for Canadian Studies at the University of Washington teaches a critical indigenous language, which is Nuktitut, um, and offers a significant part of its Title VI funding to graduate students who hope to learn it. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the, the language of the land that we're on here in Seattle, Southern Lashutseed, and offer you a greeting in that language, Hatslab Dubitseed. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jeff Reidinger, who's going to talk a little bit about the uh, Fulbright Chair and his office's role in uh, helping to foster that relationship. Thanks, Nadine and Richard. Um, delighted to, to join you. Very excited about the talk, um, but particularly pleased with this 13-year partnership um, with Fulbright Canada that Nadine mentioned. Uh, and I am share her delight that uh, today's focus is education, but I note that over the years, we've hosted chairs in ethnomusicology, orn ornithology, public policy, law, marine biology, hydrology, killer whale conservation. I mean, we're literally touching, the Canadian Studies Center at, is touching the whole of the university. And that's a very exciting uh, undertaking um, that area studies is not simply housed in the Jackson School of International Studies, but is partnering across this campus because the challenges that the US and Canada face together no, no disciplinary nor geographic boundaries. Um, so delighted that um, by today's presentation, but more generally delighted by this long-term partnership. I'm also delighted that in uh, the years since I returned to the University of Washington, that uh, Anamari Kause, uh, now president of the University of Washington, has joined the Fulbright Canada board. She's proud to serve on that. Um, it's a little more challenging these days because the in-person meetings have switched as this has to virtual, uh, but I'm delighted to have this university represented on that important board. And with that, um, i simply say greetings on behalf of President Kase and Provost Mark Richards, and then want to turn this over to Michael Haas to briefly say a word or two, uh, and Michael, I echo the earlier comments of thanks. This is a great, great partnership. Uh, and thank you for your extraordinary work as CEO of Fulbright Canada. I, uh, I, I, for me, as I said, this is, this is a labor of love. We've had a phenomenal relationship with the University of Washington. Thank you, Nadine, for your kind words. Uh, when I took this job, my board chair was a guy named George Weyerhaeuser, uh, famous uh, Seattle, Washington, Washingtonian. Uh, I have worked with Nadine. I've known uh, Jeff since from before his his return to the University of Washington. Anna Mari is not only a member of our board, an outspoken, incredibly engaged, and incredibly thoughtful member of our board, and uh, and that's saying a lot given the the quality and impact that that board has. Uh, frankly, we've had a great relationship with the University of Washington. In addition to this 13-year program, we have given 81 Fulbright Canada grants to students and scholars at the University of Washington, not to mention all those other University of Washington students and scholars who've gone to Fulbright grants around the world. You are one of the leading providers of our students and our scholars, so congratulations on that. I um, I have been given the, the, the wonderful task of introducing Kathy, and you all know that she is the Fulbright Canada Chair in Arctic Studies at the Canadian Studies Program in the Jackson School at the University of Washington. 
You also know that she's a professor of education and like everyone on this call, I value education almost above all other things. Without these opportunities, uh, none of our leaders, none of our young people, none of our citizens would have the opportunity to have these kinds of discussions which allow us ultimately to move forward. I know this is a difficult moment, but we will move forward. You all know uh, Kathy's uh, resume. What you might not know is the incredible amount of time she herself has spent in the Arctic and the far north. As the daughter of a, of a teacher and professor, as a young woman growing up in that community, as a person fully engaged with what it means to be a citizen of the Arctic and to understand the North, we, are, we could be no more privileged than to have Kathy in this chair and giving us, uh, providing leadership today. So with that, I congratulate all of you, and in particular you, Kathy, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom with us. Thank you very much, and I, I guess that's my cue to, to start. Um, I'm speaking to you today from um, my home in uh, Prince Edward Island, which is in Mi'kmaq, the traditional territory of the, the Mi'kmaq. And it's unceded territory. And it's probably not where I was initially intending to be giving this, this talk from, um, but COVID-19 had other plans for all of us this spring. Um, what I wanted to do though, and this is one of the things that I think positions sort of all of the work that I do is, is try to see the positives and the advantages that come out of adversity. And one of the, the real advantages that has come out of this, this talk being positioned the way it is, is, is what we've, we've started to allude to already, is the fact that um, I think the traditional, at least my understanding of the traditional Fulbright conversation or sort of lecture is a, is, is a lecture where your expert sort of tells you um, and shares all of the wonderful things that they've done um, and sort of and their and their position as an expert. And again, coming out of out of the area that I work in, I'm always very very tentative and cautious about um, talking about Inuit and talking for Inuit because there's been so much appropriation of knowledge and culture and false claims two things that I, I'm really never comfortable in that space. And so when I first looked at, oh, what is this Fulbright talk going to be? It, it quite intimidated and scared me. And so this opportunity to be able to present it the way we have as a panel um, with a group of us sharing sort of our collective and our collaborations um, together, uh, how we came to understand and look at um, what is Inuit education in Nunatsi, what I think is a far better way to have this conversation um, than had we been limited sort of by space and time and travel and distance and, and money um, to, the, to the standard one person show talk. And so today's conversation really will be a, a discussion, a very loose discussion. And we plan to start with me giving a little bit of background. Um, Doris, who's having a bit of trouble connecting in as she's running from one place to the other, but hopefully will join us shortly. Um, we'll be talking about her community and teaching in her school in Hope Jail. Diane will talk to us about the post-secondary experience and her own story of transitioning. And finally, Jody will, will close um, sharing the, the overview and the governmental position. Oftentimes we, we flip from, um, you know, looking, I, I always say, if we're looking for places to blame, when we say education is failing our kids, we're looking for, we point all these fingers, well, it's the schools and it's the communities and it's the, it's the, it's the system, right? So these are the blame points. So I've, I've put all of our, our blame people here, but I'm, they're not to be blamed. Um, they're to be celebrated for the successes that we do see. Um, but as, as we start, uh, let's see how I, how I do here. Um, I'm going to just flip up a map. And now I, I lose track of what you see, so I hope, let's see. Um, here we go. Here we go. So as I came to the work, um, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you that when I first heard the name Nunatsiavut, I kind of paused, even growing up in Nunavut. I thought, well, where is this, where is this place? Um, what, it, what is Nunatsiavut? Uh, 
And then I was very proud of myself because I thought, oh, you know, that's but that's Labrador. Um, and I, I felt very, you know, wise as a Canadian that I know that Nunatsia Wood is Labrador, but that's that's an oversimplification because Nunatsia Wood is not Labrador. Um, it's a separate entity into itself within Labrador. So Nunatsia Wood is comprised of five communities um, with a relatively small population. You'll see there the five communities. I don't know if you see my mouse when I roll it across, but they're the five communities sort of bundled together on the coast in the yellow area that is. Nunatsia, but um, don't let that sort of six little red dot up at the tip fool you. Um, that's a former community that is no longer um, settled and is a part of uh, Nunavut. And there are other communities that are missing along the coast, um, Hebron, for example, which is uh, no longer settled. So when you when you look at Nunatsia, but it's, it's important to understand um, how, sm how small the territory is, but how mighty the territory is. And when I say small, I mean small in terms of population. Because if you look a little bit below, you'll see in the light blue areas, a small island, uh, Prince Edward Island nestled in, the, in among all the islands at the sort of southern portion of Canada on the east. Look at the difference in the size, right? So we're talking about a very large land mass with a very small population. Um, and also, if we think about it in terms of geography, um, being so far east, Nunatsiavut and most of the East Coast was sort of first point of contact from European settlements, right? So as, as the Europeans were coming across, the shortest path is the Atlantic Ocean. And so Nunatsiavut has dealt with negotiated um, contact with Europeans for some of the longest known record. The first Moravian missionary uh, mission was set up in Maine um, in 1771. So there's a very, very long history of, of, of influence, right? But if you, if you look then, as Nadine was telling us about when, when we began, it's actually the youngest um, land claims area. So their land claim settlement occurred in 2004. And I'm not an expert in land claims, but the other thing that stands out for me from that piece is that in 2005, Nunatsuvut was also the first independent Inuit government to achieve self-government. So where other territories have um, negotiated different uh, political structures within their land claims agreement, Nunatsiavut was able to, in their negotiations, declare their land claims as well as put and enact in place a full government. So that means that the Nunatsiavut government does have control over, over education when they choose to assert it. Currently Nunatsiavut um, works with the Newfoundland and Labrador School Board. And so they are working in partnership there and Jody will talk more about that. Um, and I, th I think what I've heard is it's really, a, it's a part of capacity building and working together in partnership before um, getting the resources in place, before um, fully, fully independent systems is, are declared. Um, but that I'll, I'll sort of stop at the risk of talking too much um, about things I don't know enough. Um, I'm going to stop there and let others fill in those kinds of gaps. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of background and context so that you know where we're talking about and the kinds of um, relationships that have, have started and what those relationships are sort of look like and are shaped like. From there, I want to talk about our team. So how I came to know Nunatsi Wood and all of the, the women that are going to be speaking today started with a project that I did with uh, Melanie O'Gorman, uh, who's who's pictured in green in the front row um, and the white sweater. Uh, as Shelley Tullock, who is standing next to me in the, in the blue and white uh, shift, uh, the three of us came together and, and put together a proposal. Oh, with Sandy McCulley, who may be here. I'm not sure if he is. Uh, the four of us actually came together and started a project looking at student success and persistence. We wanted to um, capture the stories of success and help to raise the voices of those communities and schools that were having success to act as a conduit for helping other communities um, and sharing of, of resources and ideas and strategies for supporting students. So what that meant in the research wasn't that we were overlooking or trying to ignore the challenges that different schools and communities face, but rather looking at the creative solutions that were found for these challenges. So we, we framed the project around um, these two research questions, which was really the idea of persistence. So what is contributing to persistence and what is contributing to withdrawal from public schools, so K-12, 
particularly at grade transitions. What were the grades that were most difficult for students to pass through? Um, what was happening at those times? And then also we wanted to look at the progression through schools and that moved into post-secondary. So what was happening as students were graduating and moving on um, and how was their achievement being recognized and how was it being assessed? To do that, we worked with the new Nutsiavut government in partnership um, and received a SHRP grant and held an Inuit Educators Forum where we brought together teachers from around Nunatsiawut to have conversations about, you know, what is happening in your school? Um, what are the challenges and the opportunities? We also conducted across Inuit Nunangat with the thanks of an Arctic Net funding grant, uh, five case studies. So we worked with communities, we worked with um, the Inuit Education Council for direction to Say, well which communities are, are having a lot of graduation success um, where should we go who should we talk to and they identified uh, five communities where we should go one in each region of Inuit Nunangat so we were in Nunavut, Nunatsiavut, um, the NWT and as well as Nunavik and we spent uh, a great deal of time just talking with people in those communities and sort of capturing those stories and this is what Doris will tell you about is the story of her community um, we also conducted, and Diane led this, the post-secondary interview. So we, we reached out and called and talked to as many post-secondary Inuit graduates as we could to find out, well, what is your experience like once you've graduated from school? And Diane will talk to you about, about what that looks like. Um, and together, all of these sort of conversations, we hope to build into a, a resource or a conversation about sharing what can work rather than seeing the the challenges as limitations we try to look at them as as opportunities for creative problem solving just as we've done today with the presentation um, in terms of education generally just some some background um, thoughts that really helped to position where we came from and, and the kind of work that we do was that foundational assumption that you know and you would have always had education in their school in their communities Prior to colonial disruption, Inuit education was based on experiential learning, right? It was integral to daily life. Um, it wasn't measured in the same ways that we see sort of Eurocentric views of, of curriculum and assessment, but it very much was there. And the curriculum that was taught was, was far more holistic. It was about learning your identity. It was about learning how to interact with the world around you. Um, and it was learning how to interact with one another. Once European mission schools, federal day and residential schools came into play in communities, education was fundamentally disrupted for Inuit communities. So we tried to look back at, well, what what was, right? What are, what are those values? And so the, the project actually even began with a very fundamental question of, well, what is success? How are students and schools and communities defining what is success? Um, and the answer wasn't graduation rates. That's part of the answer, but that's not the complete answer. Um, from there, those conversations, some really big um, themes came out as these success markers, right? Language, language restoration was a big priority. Um, and a marker for success. That's, that young people would be able to speak their language and use it confidently. Another big marker was um, cultural and traditional knowledge and having that included in, in, in schools and part of their curriculum. And then the, the final one was that whole child. So individual and community health supports. Those were three key, key themes that came out of the work. Um, below, you'll see I've listed some of those challenges. Right, so with regard to language restoration, in some communities we found that there was um, difficulty with young people going into an institute classes um, because the parents didn't quite understand what the meaning of, of those classes would be for their children. Um, there were sometimes challenges finding speakers that could teach those courses and there were sometimes challenges um, balancing the language instruction um, within your curriculum in a meaningful well way as well as teacher fatigue because Frequently what we found in schools is where you had your institute fluent speaker, not only were they teaching the institute courses, but they were pulled into translation for a lot of different reasons. Um, the challenges we found coming out of land-based curriculum or traditional curriculum, 
often had to do with policies, policy regulations about land use. Um, for example, some school board policies say that you can't take children out on ATV vehicles. Uh, it will be very difficult, I think, to go anywhere in Hopedale uh, without riding on a very traditional ATV vehicle <laughs> or a very a classic ATV. Um, the other thing that we found as a, as a challenge that was identified was uh, elder engagement and respectful engagement with elders and compensation for elders and finding policy that would balance those things. And finally, um, it was the assessment piece. How do you, how do you assess uh, progression in cultural competencies in a respectful way? And how do you assess, how do you assess full stop in a way that is, respons that is responsive and culturally respectful? Um, within the community health supports and, and youth development, we found some conflicting aims of education and conflicting values. Um, sort of those that, that we see often are sort of me-centric versus we-centric types of values that promote a competition versus collaboration. Um, and the other thing that we saw was conflicts around the way that schools were positioned in the community and how they functioned either as a core and central part of the community or not. And I'm listing all of these challenges so that you're aware of them because as we, as we start to have more conversation as Diane and Doris and Jody start to tell you their stories, you'll see the answers to all of these challenges because sometimes these challenges are, are placed up as barriers and limitations and we can't move forward because of all of these things. Um, today you're going to hear from these three women solutions to all of these things. Um, yeah, and with that, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop and I'm going to very briefly introduce each one of the panelists, um, just in terms of my personal relationship with them. They will each uh, tell you a little bit about themselves as they tell their story, but I wanted to tell you a couple of things about each that I think they might be too humble or too shy to tell you about themselves. So I'm going to start with Doris. I, I came to meet Doris when I was working um, in, in Hopedale, uh, conducting the case study. And at that time, she was an IBID student. So she was a member of the only um, Canadian uh, education program that has certified Inuit instructors in community um, that offers teacher certification that is accepted across Canada. So it's, it's a phenomenal program that she graduated from. Um, and since she's graduated, she's moved into the school. And she, she told me very quietly the other day that since she started teaching, uh, there has been a phenomenal uptake among the young people in terms of uh, enrollment into an institute classes. So the, the youth have been asking her, please, can we continue? So where an institute used to end in their school, they've now started looking at how they can add further grades and advance the students further because they all want to work with her. Um, with Diane, I came to meet her through the post-secondary studies, perhaps a little bit uh, before that, and she, like me at the time, were, was based in Nova Scotia, and so I've been so blessed to work with her. So she, she sort of came to me as a, as a student, um, but honestly, the learning's been both ways. I've probably learned more from Diane than I have um, taught her, if, if anything at all, because we've had these powerful conversations, and so Diane is one to watch. Um, if you're looking for another Fulbright scholar, Diane is, is definitely on your, should be on your radar because she's so insightful and thoughtful in terms of the work that she's been doing and thinking about how to do it. And she's helped me really understand even my position as, as a settler and whether or not I can make claims to being an ally. Um, so it very, very, I'm looking forward to hearing what she's going to say today. And then finally, Jody. Jody is somebody that um, reminds me constantly uh, what great administration looks like. Um, oftentimes, when people move up through the system, um, you know, the, 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 the job takes over and they forget. Um, and it becomes hard. To, you start getting mired in all of the work that you, you don't know who the students are that you're working for anymore. I'm pretty sure Jody can tell you the name of every single graduate from, uh, from Nunatsiwit. Um, for the past five years, maybe longer, and where they are and what they're doing. Um, she's just a role model of what it means to stay connected and understand your students. And I've just been so um, lucky to, to work with her. And she's also, she'll move mountains for her students, but she's also got this grace and natural ability to work under pressure. Uh, for me personally, while COVID is happening and 
I'm trying to homeschool and I'm trying to do all of these things. You know, I, I've given up. I've given up on so many things. And then I, I look on Facebook in my moments and Jody's daughter is presenting her homeschool project, which is um, rooftop reports. And so every day I have this lovely bright spot from Marin as she reminds us of, you know, how we can just keep going and be consistent. Um, and, you know, that comes from, from mom for sure. And so I'll, I'll stop talking there and I'm going to pass it over to, to Doris um, and let her tell you um, about her community. Welcome everyone. Atili, hi. Um, thank you for the awesome introduction, Kathy. Uh, she said, I'm from Hopedale, Nunatiavut. The population in Hopedale is approximately 700 people, and our all grade school, the Amos Communities Memorial School, has about 140 students from K to 12, as well as ABE 1 and 2. And this year we have uh, 11 graduates from grade 12, as well as ABE, which is amazing. Um, we have promising practices in our Hopedale School. We are establishing pathways for future financial stability for all students at home. Students are able to, uh, except for this year, <laughs> um, go on school trips to visit job sites or uh, shadow careers. Um, adult basic education program, which is ABE 1 and 2, A ABE 3 isn't offered in the school, but um, they have access to Academy, Academy Canada here in Hopedale where they can get their ABE3. Um, distance education for pre-university students is offered through CDLI. Um, I'll touch on the adult basic education again. In recent years, the school implemented a program that would accommodate those students who struggled in a regular classroom setting. The ABE program would assist students in achieving their level one and two requirements. And this is done at their own pace. Um, to date, there have been many who were able to graduate from high school thanks to this program. Had it not been for this incentive, many of these students would more than likely have dropped out without a second thought. The ABE program is very supportive of those who are struggling and um, is very successful in meeting meeting the needs of these particular students. We have a community, community liaison officer, and uh, she ensures accountability with caring. If children are not in school, this person calls or visits the home of the child, and she also works with the parents to find the truant children. Uh, she builds a respectful relationship with families that need additional help. For example, um, if a child, for some reason, is not attending school, um, she'll find ways to uh, um, perhaps bring homework back and forth from the school to the to the child's home, just to make sure that they don't fall behind. Uh, she mediates between the school and youth, and this is particularly for the high school students. Um, I believe that the dropout rate has diminished. However, attendance and lateness is still an issue. Prior to, the, pr prior to attending the IBID pro program, I served as the community liaison officer for the school. During this time, the percentage of lateness and absenteeism dropped and uh, parental involvement was um, increasing, which was really good. Um, our community takes great pride um, and engagement in the school. There's real parent and teacher communication through parent-teacher nights but well, the school also has an open door policy. Um, many community events or functions are hosted at the school. There is a parental award every June for um, parents to go above and beyond and is, and is recognized. 
uh, students share products of school with, with the elders. For example, in my Inukidu classes, I not only teach Inukidu, but I also teach the youth the importance of um, respecting the land, respecting our elders, and uh, they might have a task of going to chop wood for elders or um, shovel the walkway for them. Um, it's things like this that our elders recognize and they really appreciate that the youth still have that um, very much deserved respect for them. Um, we have a uh, active uh, school council and it's comprised of um, nine or so members with just two or three who might be from the staff and the, the remaining members are parents. Um, again, with community involvement, for the most part, the community supports the school. Parents are involved in different programming throughout the school, such as, um, again, the school council. And on a monthly basis, our school has a parent student teacher night, which usually is geared around um, certain holidays or um, different themes in the school. And it's very often that there's a high success, highly successful turnout, even with um, former students who have graduated coming in with their younger siblings. Um, the school supports success with a safety net. There, throughout the school, you might find uh, posters of previous students who are now parents in um, settings with their uh, current employment. And uh, there's a Going Off, Going Strong program where um, at-risk youth are paired with respected elders in the community and they might um, go off on the land where they'll enhance their already um, known skills or learn new skills from these elders with regards to how you take care of the land, how you um, catch your your uh, wildlife and how you prepare the food. And these programs, uh, th there are programs based in uh, Goose Bay. Goose Bay is about a 50 minute ride from Hopedale. And that's where I attended the IBED program. And had it not been in Goose Bay, I would have not, I wouldn't have completed it. I uh, tried to do it in uh, the capital of, uh, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador and it was overwhelming for me. I, I gave up after two weeks because of culture shock and where Goose Bay is the hub of Labrador. People travel here um, for medical or whatnot and there is also a college there. So I was quite familiar with, with Goose Bay and comfortable with it as well. I had uh, family members there so it wasn't so daunting to take on the IBIT program when I did. Our school is culturally driven. We have uh, elusive, which is life skills. Um, there is also inusive, which is um, similar to skill trades. And you're taught different things in these programs, such as um, wooden sled building, we call homotic building. Um, baking, um, hunting and gathering activities. The children and youth are taught many aspects of our culture. It's very culturally rich. Um, annually, there is a grade nine trip on the land and those gearing towards grade nine know about this trip and it's like the ultimate thing that they look forward to in turn, um, going into grade nine. And with the grade nine trip, there is um, 
some challenges with regards to provincial regulations, but uh, it's a very successful trip that happened. Um, there's long-term leadership with cultural understanding, as well as the community support and engagement. If uh, we, we have six Inuit staff, uh, staff here at the school and uh, if any of these knowledge holders aren't able to um, deal with a task or not not able to answer certain questions we're able to reach out into the community for our elders and other knowledge holders to um, assist us in our teaching the inuktitut resources available in our school right now um, it, it shows that rebuilding language remains a crit critical challenge not just in Popedale but along the coast there are activities to um, assist and support the language, such as the annual Inuktitut Speak Off. And in the past, it used to be a competition, but in recent years, it was changed so that students aren't discouraged to want to learn their language and showcase it. So it's become very support oriented rather than being competitive. The Rosetta Stone CD um, is still available, but it, it's only for, it only, is only compatible with certain programs, and I can't remember which ones right now, but um, we do have it available, and um, it's also free from our Nunat Seawit government for people in the community if they'd like to avail of these, this resource. Um, the resources themselves, they don't exist the way they do for English, um, English curriculum or courses. Most of the resources we have have been made by uh, current teachers or Inuktitut teachers who were there previously. And these are made by teachers who teach a whole day and then on their own time are making these resources so that they're not only student friendly, but also for um, other teachers to be able to use and access. Um, in conclusion, our school prides itself in facing challenges together for children we take a family approach to education and we are keen on supporting an environment that is safe and free for informal and formal education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doris. It was, thank you for, for telling us about, about Hopedale. Um, I think we'll, we'll keep questions to the end and Diane, if you are ready and you want to start um please jump right in sure can you hear me okay can you hear me okay not to meet doris it's so nice to see you and all the fellow inuit here um yeah it was just really great to hear you making me homesick and can I be your student? <laughs> so I'll just get going then. So I'm an urban Inuk. Uh, I'm mixed with white settler ancestry from Britain on my father's side and Inuit ancestry on my mother's side whose family is from Inakiavut. So being urban means that I really uh, incult acculturated to urban southern space, which is a predominantly settler society imposed upon unceded Mi'kmaq lands here in Nova Scotia and Halifax, where I am. And I've lived here in Nova Scotia for 18 years, so that's like half of my life now. So this means that I'm limited in my experience of what it means currently live in complexities of remote Inuit communities in the north. 
um, at an Inuit school, Inuit ancestry. And while I've lived there as a child, um, and my family is, you know, my grandmother specifically is a survivor of the residential school system, survivors of the Hebron relocation. I myself am a, I'm a survivor of the child welfare system. Many Inuit, especially younger Inuit experiences are not the same that I may have had. And they may not feel the same about, um, you know, about the experiences that I share. And so it's really important to understand that how I approach the sharing uh, in, in, in my passion of seeking to create equity and space for Inuit voices is that we each have our own separate unique experiences um, and we must create spaces to hear all of those voices, especially those furthest at the, at the furthest margins who experience housing insecurity, food insecurity. And so really that all to say is that it's important not to overgeneralize and that I cannot be expected to speak for all sort of Inuit post-secondary student experiences. Um, and really, I, I want to say as well that um, where I am, I'm really just heartbroken with the trage tragedies that are occurring, with the, the violence and the um, atrocities that are being inflicted on Black people in Minneapolis right now. So that is really at the top of my mind, and I just really want to speak to that because it's important. So, um, yeah, there are two sort of main deep-rooted beliefs that I hold that guide my work. One is that I operate with the belief that in order to know others of different cultures and races, we must know ourselves, right? So I speak and situate myself in my own um, biracial positionality as an Inuk and a white settler, and that's really important. Um, to name that. And so that's going to frame my work. I've really gotten deeper more into anti-racist education, being here in, in the South in post-secondary education for, for more than 10 years. Um, and so the other belief that I work with is that we must be willing to exchange comfort for racial consciousness. Okay, so that just means that as difficult as it is, when I, you know, name race and when I name my whiteness, it causes a lot of emotional responses. And being able to sit with that and that discomfort and leaning into it as a way in rather than as a way out is so critical. So deep breath for that. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk about two sort of compounding mechanisms that contribute to the lack of representation of Inuit students, staff, and faculty here in post-secondary education in the South because, as Doris mentions, there are currently no to few colleges and universities available in our northern communities. And as she mentioned, this negatively impacts our ability to continue to attend these institutions to complete. Um, it impacts our well-being overall. So, for example, I know that I'm only about 5 to 10 percent of, of Inuit attending graduate level post-secondary education. That's a very small percentage. So, getting to the heart of the issues for me in describing the challenges that Inuit youth face is that we are entering into white Western education systems and naming that is really important. The systemic and institutional barriers embedded in our education is sort of the macro external level, the mechanism. The other mechanism and factor is that the more community and personal recovery from the history of ongoing um, and historical trauma and cultural genocide. So there's the macro, the external, and then there's the internal of carrying the weight and the burden of recovering from uh, centuries of colonization. So this was important for me because when I began my secondary education and my research, really I was being immersed into a dominant discourse of pathology of why are Inuit somehow not achieving levels seen by dominant white groups. So that's sort of the, the literature that I was immersed into and sort of a dominant discourse. And so what I began to understand is that this is more of a symptom of not being able to access education that reflects our own values, um, our own forms of Inuit knowledge and education, and rather, in fact, our education has been attempted to be erased in place for dominant 
knowledge and education that has been built for white people. And so I don't say that to shame or to blame. It's more so to acknowledge upon the advantages. Um, and again, I am part settler, right? So I own that. that. Because I'm part settler, it grants me access to spaces that say a full racialized or a full in a person may not be able to access. So rather than wondering where are any, <laughs> why aren't we able to meet the requirements um, to, uh, of admissions to these institutions, we must see the roots of these systems not originally being designed for us, but rather for white settler society to continue to reproduce and perpetuate itself at the expense of others. So this is the naming of the systemic and structural racism, which I know causes, causes discomfort, right? When we can talk about, you know, these identity politics, specifically the identity, we must be able to name those who gaze at us, and those who have been gazing at us for centuries through the field of anthropology, and now through fields of science seeking data to better understand our changing climate in the, the global Arctic. So, what does this mean, right? Right now, when we enter into post-secondary, those who sit at the table with institutional power, who are they predominantly, right? They're male, middle class, able-bodied, heterosexual identities. And being able to name this, for me, is a really big type of relief. It's a big type of relief because we don't have to hide or deny or have shame in that. Because if we choose not to see this dominance as they are, then we expect all others to conform to that, to that society. And we cannot account for the differences in our lived reality. So when we pretend not to see things, we keep our worldviews insulated and protected and unchallenged. And those worldviews are then projected onto others who are racialized and who are indigenous. So, <laughs> you know, working through all of these emotional, challenging emotional responses really is recognizing that it's common, it's normal to feel anxious, to feel any sort of anger, indifference, um, and being able to name that is important. Um, because that enables us to move forward to the next stages of advancing of equity, inclusion, diversity, anti-racism. So that's part of our personal inner transformation of healing from colonization, of healing from racial trauma and other harmful impacts of being conditioned into either dominant racial groups or subordinate racial groups, because there are those two main groupings that we have. So in, in attempting to create equity for indigenous peoples, we need to be able to see ourselves as racial beings, even those of us who are in proximity to whiteness, which is sort of the dominant racial condition that we have. And a critical component of cross-racial skill building is the ability to sit with the discomfort of being seen racially of having to proceed as if race matters, because it does. We are building our stamina uh, to be with all emotional responses that come up, and being able to create space to really listen and hear from racialized people, and especially those who voices who are not at the table. I'm talking about those Inuit families who continue to live in deep poverty after being dispossessed of our land, those who aren't able to access, who struggle with severe mental health crises, such as, you know, I heard um, another colleague talk about, many of us have been affected by suicide, right? So we carry this when we come into these institutions and when we are in classrooms with people who don't know our history, that is another emotional triggering that we have to um, move through in our education. So I understand that sometimes there's a myth of meritocracy, 
and we need to dispel that myth of meritocracy. We are not coming with the same history. We are not on an even playing field. So for example, low-income communities and kids worry about how they're going to get to their house when they move, worry about transportation, worry about loans. Um, our parents cannot co-sign loans because they have no credit because we have been forced to make ends meet, for example. So generational wealth is systemic. And we see when we see Inuit and racialized peoples with graduate degrees, our wealth does not actually increase because we share our incomes with our families who are in need. So we redistribute our wealth. Um, so that's the sort of structural and systemic. And then for us, um, Inuit entering into these spaces, what happens with us often um, is that we have a dual consciousness where we must learn to be socialized into the Western white world to survive and to continue in these systems. And these systems are rooted in individualistic values. They shape the social fabric reflected in policies and laws and practices that govern our day-to-day -day lives and that those values are imposed upon us as standards of norms and standards of education. So those standards are also designed to advantage the self um, rather than those, like say, those of us who come from holistic collectivist communities. So this is accompanied by the burden of always having to teach because we're often the first generation in our families to attend university. So we're often um, burdened with teaching others about our lived experience. And this is problematic because it has to do with us and not with the person, people receiving that information. Um, this framework denies that racism is a relationship in which both groups are involved, right? Um, so that creates a lot of tension on us, those of us who are speaking out um, that, that role is on, placed on to us. Um, so we navigate these two worlds um, and sort of I'll leave with some final thoughts from a, an author that I've been reading recently, Anishinaabe author Leanne Simpson. And she says that we learn to type, to read, and to write. We learn how to think within the confines of Western thought. We aren't taught how to think critically about colonialism and its impacts on our lives. Post-secondary education provides very few skills to those of us who want to learn the ways of our people. And from the perspective of Inuit um, traditional knowledge, where we know that words don't teach, but actually experience provides the knowledge that's necessary to create sustainable futures for ourselves, the lands, and for all beings on the earth. Um, so, yeah, I really just hold a vision that we cultivate communities and cultures of care for each other, for all beings, regardless of what race we are, but we need to acknowledge the lived experience of those who do not come from our own perspective um, in moving forward. There's so much work that needs to be done. Um, there's many, many resources out there that I'd be happy to share. All the resources that I've drawn on today have been, you know, from anti-racist educators, and there's just a lot. Um, so I encourage people to continue in this work. Thank you. That's for me. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, I recognize, as as usual, we're we're running a little long. Um, if you have to drift out, then you know, please uh, don't feel bad about that because I know that um, time is precious at the moment. If you can stay, it would be wonderful. Um, uh, Jody is, is about to tell us about um, her perspectives on, on these same issues. Um, and then we'll, we'll shift to the question period after it. So without further ado, Jody. All right, thank you. Um, thanks, Kathy, for the invite for today and the warm welcome. Um, so having heard what Doris talked about um, and the IBED program, um, 
it, it's kind of, I feel like a, um, a proud mom here because Diane and Doris are our are, are graduates. So um, every time I see some of my, my students, because they're my students, Every time I see some of my students doing these wonderful things, I just sit back and just tears and and just heartwarming. So it's really wonderful, and I'm so glad that they're they're both here and uh, and sharing their stories. Doris doesn't give herself enough credit because, I mean, she said she was the community liaison officer when she started out or the worker, and um, when she talked about the attendance rate. Um, uh, increasing and the lateness decreasing that was all her that was her interaction with the the, the, the community and and her caring for the people so um, she, it was a natural um, progression into the IBED hey Doris and it just needed a little shove on the plane <laughs> But um, what I want to talk about today is the Nunatsiavut government's um, relationship with our school district. Like Kathy said, um, I, I talk fast. That's the Newfoundlander in me. I'm Inuit on my mom's side, and my dad is a Newfie, so um, I get the fast talking from there. So wave your hand if I'm going too fast and it's glitchy. But um, as Kathy said, in our in our land claims agreement, we have right to what I like to say, take over our school system. Um, I am very vocal about the fact that our K-12 system is not working. Um, I don't feel that our education system is successful when you have people who are told they're a grade 12 graduate and still have to go for two or three years sometimes of upgrading at college before they can get into a university or higher level college program. To me, they're not a high school graduate if they can't walk out of their community and go into school. So there's problems we need to fix. And I know it's not just a, a, an indigenous issue. I know it's everywhere, but we're focusing on our people and, and making some strides there. Um, so currently the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District is still um, providing us with our K-12 system. Um, we have the jurisdiction to uh, assume that responsibility, but we're nowhere near ready. Um, I want to have bookshelves full of resources and curriculum guides and courses ready to go, and we're not there yet, but we're working on it. So what the Nunatsiavu government does every year is we provide a substantial amount of money through a contribution agreement to the, English, the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District which I'll call the school district for saving time. Um, that money is meant to cover everything that's not the provincial responsibility, but what we want to see in our schools. So as you know how governments run, there's cuts all the time. Um, so what, what our money has started to do is pick up the slack where some of those uh, areas have been cut. Um, we're only five communities, so we have five schools. Uh, we have a, our smallest school is 30 this year, look on my list, 32 this year, and our biggest school is actually split into two buildings, so there's roughly 200 uh, students in Maine. So we have a range of, of numbers here, but um, so when we have activities like sports meets, drama festivals, or choir, and those get cut because it's so expensive to travel, that's where some of our money goes to ensure that our students can still participate in those activities that I know for a fact, some of those activities are why some students stay in school. And if that's what it takes, then we'll spend the money on it. Money well spent, right? Um, the school district and us, we work really well together. Uh, every year they put forward a budget of what the thing, they think the needs would be. Uh, a lot of those things are, are standard every year, such as our uh, language and culture programming. So it's not the province's responsibility to provide inuktitut instruction or, or cultural programming at all. So anything that we want that has a cultural lens, we pay for. So what that has, has um, started with is back in the 70s yet, Doc, the late Dr. Beatrice Watts um, was the first Inuit to Inuit woman to get a uh, Bachelor of Education degree, um, and she was our first certified teacher. And so the school district um, back then, the school board took took advantage of that and got her on side to start developing 
uh, ineptitude curriculum and things like that. So fast forward 30 some odd years to where we are now and our schools all have ineptitude courses. Um, K to nine core ineptitude. We do have three high school courses in ineptitude developed. However, um, they aren't consistently delivered. Um, I have a, a huge problem with our K our, our Inuktitut system, as, as Doris knows well of as our Inuktitut teacher, there's a lot of um, a lot of room for improvement, let's put it that way. So what we just recently did was we paid for an evaluation. We hired uh, uh, Sylvia Moore, who's on the call, as well as Shelley Tullock, um, and uh, they're just finishing up the K-12 Inuktitut evaluation, which went to all our communities, talked to teachers, parents, students, uh, administrators, and, and really got to the root of the issues. Uh, so I'm really excited about that because now we have a report because you know how it is in the world. Uh, we can know all we want. But it's not real knowledge unless it's written down <laughs> for someone to read. So um, we'll have that report now that we can take to our government to be able to advocate for money to start um, re reforming the K to 12 enough to do system because I am a product of that system. I can't speak Inuktitut. My children are currently in that system. They can't speak Inuktitut any more than I could. Um, people like Doris now is a shining light in our system because now we have someone who has an understanding of what it is to be a teacher as well as the knowledge of the language, which is what we need. So I'm super excited that Doris hightailed back to Hopedale and took her role that we knew she was going to fit so well into. I'm so proud of her and don't you ever leave us. <laughs> Doris. Um, so um, that's just one one part of our funding dollars goes into the Inuktitut pro program. We also have a curriculum center that uh, employs a program specialist and um, curriculum developers that constantly work on curriculum development. However, again, they're not specialized in curriculum development. These are speakers who have education degrees and who are trying their best to make all these pieces fit. So with this evaluation now, we'll hopefully be a bit, we'll be able to get our ducks in a row. And hopefully um, in 10 or so years, 20 years, we'll have some speakers coming out of our, our schools, which is, which is wonderful. I can't wait. Um, the Doris mentioned the Elusivut and Inusivut programs in our schools, um, and those are the highlight of a lot of our schools. The culture is alive in those programs. Um, I'll use this as an example now, um, toting my son's work. Uh, this is a pair of sealskin mitts that my son made. Um, these weren't actually made in school. He is he took to it so well and enjoys it so much that he does this at home uh, in his spare time. There's so many pairs of mitts and sealskin slippers kicking around my house that he refuses to sell because everything he makes he wants to keep. So now this is like the eighth pair he has. Um, this is raw sealskin, which is means it's not tan. It smells wonderful. Um, and he went to a, a local trapper who he knew had sealskin. And so like, He's weld, my son welds, he's four, 15 now and out in the shed welding grapples for nets and, and things like that. So he's welding skidoo parts and getting seal skin off of this guy. So um, now Lucas makes these and it's because of the program. It's because of Elusivut and his wonderful teacher. Uh, my daughter, same thing. She, I don't have to worry about winter wear. They make their own mitts, they've made boots, they've made slippers and my daughter beads and this is, she made this right before COVID struck and it was for me and she said this is for work so I haven't had a chance to wear it other than right now because we've been shut down and I wasn't about to dress up with sweats and a t-shirt and a beautiful necklace on. So she beads and she sews and things like that as well but this is all generated and fostered and cultivated in our school. Um, I could sew if I needed to, but I don't, so they're not going to learn it from me. Um, but this is, is very much um, uh, supported and encouraged in school, and the kids are, it's beautiful to see children walking around with, playing outside, wearing traditional clothing that they made themselves, 
and now Lucas has that skill for sure, him anyway, Marin, if she keeps up with it, but Lucas has that skill for the rest of his life. If he needs it to make money, he's already sold a number of pairs of mittens to people, uh, one of whom is on this call. <laughs> um, and, um, um, but just that skill and the pride that they have in their culture now um, is, is it's just phenomenal. The Inusivut program, which Doris talked about as more of the tra skilled trades, that's your definitely your skilled trades um, with a traditional focus. So your hamutik making, uh, going off on the land and learning about ice conditions and making shelters and hunting practices and stewardship. Um, my son is a hunter as well and a trapper and um, he has his own little boat and at our cabin last last fall he went around and he harvested a lot of um, shorebirds so he came in and he had pigeons and turs and ducks and whatnot and he had a seal so my husband rolls his eyes he's like we don't need any of this Lucas and Lucas says it's not for us so he proceeds to clean all the birds skin the seal cut up the meat and bag it all off and when we get home from the cabin we have to take them all around town because this is for this person and this is for that person so this is the fundamental skills that doris and and diane were talking about that aren't necessarily learned in a formalized education system this is the stuff i want to see in our our k-12 system right from day one and the other stuff supplement and the other stuff come in afterwards it's the the albert marshall's two-eyed seeing here and and we all know that we're living in this society we need a wage based we're in a wage-based economy we do need to have a job and and things like that but our culture and our, our values and our our traditions are what forms us and who we are and that's not in our schools enough. Um, a number of years ago, it was brought up at a youth symposium that um, our, our students asked the new government. So this is roughly 2005, 2006. Uh, the youth said, why aren't we seeing ourselves in school? And we want, we want to learn about ourselves. So this brings me to my last part, point of our, my, my, my time. Um, so that, that lit the fire and the government out of this contribution money they put aside money every year until we were finished developing an inuit history course so it's actually called labrador inuit society and culture it's a two credit high school course that was originally a local credit which means that it's just for people in nunatsiago and it has to fall under these like this little small elective pool so not 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 very encouraging to take it because so many courses have to be mandatory right so what we did because that wasn't good enough we went to the department of education and got it certified as a um, a provincial credit which satisfies either the canadian studies requirements so they can take this in place of other history courses or a fine arts course so they can take it in place of art or uh, design tech those kinds of courses because of the high art content now i'll show you the book uh, it reflects on my screen, uh, nah, not so great, but uh, it's called Inukutivut Ilukutivut, which means our people, our culture. And um, it's nicely on the back as well, beautiful. Um, so this just got published last September and it's roughly 480 pages, beautifully designed. Um, and it's a, so it's a high school credit course or two credit course, but now, the students see themselves, literally see themselves. This is Lucas. <laughs> this is my husband. <laughs> I had to take a picture. <laughs> we needed something. Uh, my daughter is in this book. Um, um, they, when children see themselves or their auntie or their community or um, their flag, our Nunatsiavut flag, or learn about residential school, or about how Nunatsiavut came to be, or about the Spanish flu. It's all here. When I was in high school, um, I think, or growing up in my social studies classes, Labrador used to be mentioned once or twice in a little corner of one page of one chapter. And it was usually Red Bay because of the Basque whalers. So, I mean, I didn't see myself at all in in my schooling 
and that's not good enough. So we're changing that. So right now this course is being offered. It's offered all across the province if anyone wanted to take it. Uh, so every kid in Nunatsia who takes the course before they graduate, they get to keep the book because we'll supply the books till, till, till we run out of money. Um, but now I just let a contract for the creation of modules for K to nine based on this book so that now it, the students don't have to wait till grade 10 or 11 or 12 to, to see themselves. They'll be able to kindergarten all the way through, little pieces all the way through. And, and it doesn't stop there. I'm very interested in a, a, a chemistry course. We're kind of in the works of starting something along those lines. And just looking at, I mean, culture in our curriculum. I want kids to be excited to come to school. I want them to, be proud of who they are in school and then be proud of who they are after they leave school and go on and be successful and and their academic achievements like diane and like doris and and our other hmm, uh our pro we have about right now just from one funding program alone um i say roughly 900 graduates from post-secondary over the last 30 years uh, with about 1,100 programs, because some of us have more than one, uh, two degrees or a certificate and a diploma, that sort of thing. So we are quite successful when it comes to post-secondary attainment. We've got a we've got a lot of work to do with our K to 12. Once we get them out of out of high school, um, they need to be a bit more prepared and ready to walk right through the post-secondary system. There's a lot of hiccups, as Doris and, and Diane could could easily sit here and talk all day about. Um, and I think with stronger academic background before they go to the post-secondary system, it, it, just, it just makes for an easier journey. But I mean, we have uh, a great relationship with the school district. Um, Lots of room for improvement on the province side, but I mean, that's n no nothing new to anybody, I guess, when you're working with governments. Um, but the Nunatsi Abbott government is very invested in education and, um, and we want to um, just keep, keep moving forward. That's it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to you, Jody, for making the time to come today. I know that you are pulled in a thousand directions all the time and you always um, manage to show up with grace and well prepared despite what you say will happen. <laughs> um, and to you too, Diane and, and Doris, I'm so thankful and grateful that I've been able to get to know you through all of this process um, to learn from you and also just to to hear your perspectives on Inuit education and, and Nunatsiavut. I have always felt so incredibly welcomed um, in Nunatsiavut and some fabulous things are happening, um, you know, in what is really a, a very small territory. And rather than, than summarize, I'm, I'm going to just sort of stop and um, leave it open because we could, we could talk for a very long time about lots of different things. We've only just scratched the surface here today. Uh, but if I, I'll, I'll just turn it over to questions and if folks would like to ask questions, I think Marion is going to help sort of identify who will ask next um, because it's very hard to watch sort of all of the screens and the hands and all of those things, but um, feel free to just sort of jump in with, with questions when you're ready. Nadine, did you have a couple of questions prepared that you wanted to ask? I do. I have lots of questions. <laughs> Just fabulous presentations, all three of you. Thank you so much. And um, I do have many questions that your comments today provoke further. Um, one of them I'm interested in is the tensions between, if there are tensions between the provincial government curriculum in Nunatsiavut and um, the Inuit curriculum and how you balance and, and how you work that out within the school system. Do you want me to, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, we, we do have, I, I think for the most part, our teachers, um, it, the, the support varies in terms of which school you're in. Um, and I think, uh, most schools are encouraged to include as much culture as they can. Um, 
Doris is in the most wonderful school and I've always said that if I had the money, I would commute and bring my kids to Hopedale every morning. Mm -hmm. I just, I fell in love with Hopedale school. They've got it. They, they know what they're doing. And their principal isn't even Inuk. He's, he's just passionate and he's got his priorities straight. So Doris is very lucky to be working in that school. Um, for example, um, it, the 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 science teacher the high school science teacher when teaching biology um she doesn't use the samples that the department of education sends in for for dissection um someone kills a po polar bear she gets she calls them up and says can i have the heart and so then the kids dissect the polar bear heart or or some other locally harvested um animal or, and things like that um there there is I don't know if I want to say there's tension, but um, they they do recognize that who we are and that we are distinct, and they encourage as long as I guess the provincial outcomes are met for for subjects, they don't really mind how you get there. Mm -hmm. So um, stu teachers are given that flexibility and freedom, uh, whether or not they're they take those freedoms uh, or run with it um, or they're encouraged to do so by their own school administrator um, that's where our hang-up is it's not necessarily that the government is telling us we can or cannot do it mm -hmm. it's how it's supported in the school mm -hmm. uh, I've heard all kinds of horror stories about teachers saying well I didn't know that I could ask for this money to do this program or to uh, we had a teacher that wanted to um, to uh, go off and fish with her class, harvest the fish, cook up the fish, all while speaking in to 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 um, connect the students to their learning, and and only be, to be told no by the principal. So when it comes to um, tensions, I think it there is tension when there's certain things like that when it comes to liability and legal um, legal responsibility, uh, and then you get certain teachers and certain principals who just say. I'll deal with it later and do it anyway. So um, it, it does vary by school, but that's the, that's the mentality that I want to change. I, I don't want to have administrators that are not going to support that kind of work. And if they don't, then they can go on and teach somewhere else. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple of questions unless you want to expand on the answer there, anybody? I would like to echo uh, what Jody was saying. I helped to develop curriculum here on Indigenous on land based learning in at the university level. And very similar, we came up with the barrier around the legal and the policy thing. So, yeah, that, that came up as well. So interesting that, that the similarity there between your uh, experience and, and down here when we try to indigenize the institution. Okay. Um, we have a question from Ashley Makoro Powell. She says, has there been an exchange about some of these educational pedagogies and frameworks being used in your communities with other Arctic schools, say in Alaska? Um, in schools directly, not so much, uh, just because we're not necessarily connected to specific schools. But uh, in 2018, I was at the Inuit Circumpolar Council um, education forum that was held in, in Greenland. And uh, at that forum, there was a lot of information sharing um, about uh, a, a lot of different initiatives in, in Russia, in Alaska, um, in Canada and Greenland. Um, so there was a bit of sharing there. Um, but I mean, uh, it's uh, often not so easy to be uh, sharing when you're trying to, when you're focusing on getting your, your stuff done here. But I mean, um, I've, uh, I, I was in Alaska uh, for an education forum prior to the Inuit Circumpolar Forum and uh, presented on education in Canada um, at that forum and they had some really great initiatives then. So there, there is a bit of sharing um, more at the Circumpolar Council level. So um, if I don't know if you wanted to ever uh, look that up in terms of 
um, some of the education forms that they've had. But I would be very interested in, in once we get a bit more into our curriculum development and, and a bit more to share, I, I would love to share it around. Great. The uh, next question from Erica Dingman. She's asking Diane, and Diane, it might be helpful if you turn your video off when you answer, because you, you were still getting that lag from you. Uh, but she asks, how does knowing yourself and the other influence your educational experience? For example, does this knowledge help you integrate the ways of both cultures? Good question. Could you um, ask the question again? How sure. does knowing yourself in both of those worlds? Yeah. How does knowing yourself and the other influence your educational experience? For example, does this knowledge help you integrate the ways of both cultures? Yeah, so knowing, so it was just in the past several years actually that I started really acknowledging and owning my white settler ancestry. And <laughs> when I would go home and into parts of Nunavut, because I speak English, you know, Inuit would, call, would say Kalbunat because I'm speaking English. And I took great offense to that at first, but over time I had to integrate that and not deny it or dismiss it. Because if I did, then that means that I'm complicit in not, in not hearing the truth of sort of what's going on in sort of the, the dominance of what whiteness means for me. So if I deny that I'm socialized into sort of a dominant culture, then it means that I could potentially make others feel unsafe who are in socialized into the more subordinate um, groups. And so I draw on many indigenous scholars. So like as Joey mentioned, um, Albert Marshall, two wide seeing, right? He really uses this framework to speak about co-learning and engaging in cultural humility and really being open and willing. Um, yeah, it takes a lot to, to navigate th that dual consciousness. That, that's the great tension that we face all of the time. Um, and it's a balance. It, it depends wherever you go. The salience of that identity depends on the situation and the context. So if I'm in a room with predominantly white folks, which I <laughs> often am in the South, my Inuit identity becomes more prominent. But when I'm in my family setting and in Inuit context, my white salient identity becomes much more prominent because they see me as different. So being able to navigate that is really important and negotiate the space with where I am, leverage my advantage and my privilege that I have to speak about oppressions that we may not otherwise acknowledge. So it has helped me in my education. Um, it gives, as I said, it gives me the tools and the resources to be able to understand where people are operating from, the consciousness that people are operating from. And having compassion, I, I studied land-based knowledge um, in my graduate work and really returning and restoring any um, cultural values that are infused in land-based knowledge really brought me into more states of awareness and compassion. Um, yeah, and I'm very interested in and continue to explore how Inuit worldview really um, invites in more mindfulness and awareness and um, kindness. And that's what Inuit Kalinexasanga teaches us. It teaches us to be um, more welcoming and operating on a holistic level. So yeah, thank you for that question. Okay, uh, Nadine has told me that we are going to have to end here for time reasons. Um, so thank you all so much for your questions. If you have additional questions that you did not get to ask or that you're still mulling over, uh, please feel free to email them to Canada at UW, or sorry, excuse me, Canada at UW, for those of you who aren't part of our organization, dot edu. Again, Canada at UW dot edu. Um, send your questions if you have them and, and we'll be sure to pass them along. Um, yeah. Yeah, good. And I just, I want to thank you so much, Kathy and Doris and Diane and Jody. 
um, and ask you actually if you would stay on a few minutes and Marion as well, um, so we can we can also say an extra goodbye. But thank you so much for your comments. It just strikes me um, the work you're doing is just fabulous. And I think, my God, the work we have to do down here in Southern institutions when you open, Kathy, about the you know how we're based on ranking and competitiveness and measuring and um, trying to work around, trying to change the institution itself is, is a very challenging job. Um, so really uh, so inspiring the work you're all doing and thank you. And thank you to all of our guests. And um, again, Nakarmik uh, to our presenters and if you could just stay on an extra few minutes. Thank you.